We have talked a bit in this course about where viruses came from, and we've touched on the idea that any new viruses that emerge today come from uh, previously established viruses. And today I want to focus us on, on this idea and talk about where uh, some of the virus infections come from that emerge uh, apparently all of a sudden. This is called emerging viruses. Now, viruses have always emerged anew from, since the beginning of life on Earth, uh, but the, the term emerging viruses is coined very recently in the 1990s when the frequency of new virus infections seem to be being occurring at a greater pace than ever before. But um, emerging viruses are nothing new. It's just the term that has been coined. Um, since people got together in, in big cities, since the rise of agriculture, this generated the possibility. Agriculture was very important in the emergence of viruses because having agriculture enabled people to get together in cities in, in big numbers, which wasn't possible before. They could be sustained. And that started the uh, greater frequency of introduction of viruses from animals into humans. So emerging viruses is a buzzword that was recently developed, but it's happened all the time. So what do we mean when we talk about emerging viruses? These, it can mean a number of different things. It could be um, an increase in the host range of a virus that we hadn't noticed before. Um, it could be transmission of a virus from an animal to humans. It could be a wild animal, could be a domesticated animal. And this we call zoonosis. When we pick up infections from animals, that has a special name, zoonosis. Uh, so sometimes this kind of infection uh, from another species establishes a new virus in the population. And SIV, HIV is a great example of that. HIV originated uh, from the virus known as SIV, and we'll talk about this in great detail next week. Many of these cross-species infections, many of these zoonotic infections, are dead ends, and the virus doesn't really establish itself in humans and doesn't transmit from human to human very well. Great examples are Ebola and Marburg, which go from bats to humans. They cause outbreaks, no doubt, but those always end. These viruses do not establish themselves in human population, and to get another outbreak, you need another reintroduction of the virus from an animal. All right? And that's in contrast to a human virus. We define a human virus as one that is maintained in the human population. It doesn't need constant reintroduction from animal sources. This is a pie chart which shows you uh, the source of viruses that we currently have that infect people. And this will show you, it will illustrate how important our uh, interactions with uh, animals is. So these are numbers of uh, genera represented by the different virus infections. So for example, the blue part of the pie uh, viruses belonging to 32 different genera. Genera is a subclassification of a family. 32 different genera are what we call adapted pathogens. All right? They are in people. They have, they're circulating among people. They don't need to be reintroduced constantly from animal sources. And they joined us after we were homo sapiens. That's what the greater than homo sapiens uh, sign means. Uh, the purple, there are 37, members of 37 different genera, we consider to be zoonotic pathogens. These are viruses that always have to jump from an animal into humans and would include uh, Nipah and Hendra and, and Ebola uh, and Marburg, etc. cetera. Uh, then we have two categories, what we call heirloom pathogens. We have inherited these from our ancestors, from our evolutionary ancestors. So the yellow heirloom path, uh, pathogens, there are about 16 of these. Uh, with these we inherited from our ancestors before Homo sapiens, or Homo species, actually. All right, and because there were other Homo species before sapiens, right? And then uh, the green is heirloom pathogens that we inherited from Homo species onwards. All right, and those are the ones in green six. And so we've got, anim we've got viruses 
contemporary viruses that we've gotten from animals, but all these other viruses that came from Homo sapiens or ancestors, those probably originated uh, in viruses as well. So obviously what's around us plays a big role in infecting us, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What are the factors that uh, lead to a virus crossing over into humans? And then I'll give you some examples of how that's happened in recent years. So the press loves this. Whenever a new virus emerges, especially if it kills people, the press you know, goes crazy because they like death and destruction. Um, and the, on the left is Newsweek from 1990-something. I can't see the date. Can anyone read that to me? OK, it's a while ago. This is an early outbreak of Ebola. It's not the one from last year. Um, killer virus. And this one, of course, is the book that I told you about before, the description of the very first uh, characterized emerging infection, as we put it in this category, the, la the emergence of Lassa virus uh, in uh, Africa. So whenever this happens, the press is on it. Now, there are many factors that lead to a, an apparent increase in the number of cross-species infections that we see. And of course, our ability to transmit them among human populations. And these are some of these convergent forces. Tr air travel, of course, is a big factor. It can bring viruses around the world uh, very quickly. Our population growth is enormous. So not only do we interact with each other and spread viruses, but we get closer to animals. We do things like deforestation uh, that uh, bring us into new environments. Uh, there are various environmental changes that we uh, cause, like tire trade and so forth that bring uh, infections around the world. And we alter ecosystems in ways that allow us to encounter pathogens. And of course, all of these provide new opportunities for us to encounter viruses we haven't seen before. And the reason that they can infect us is because of evolution. The fact that their genomes are plastic, they exist as quasi-species, lots of mutants. And one of those mutants may be just right for replicating in humans, just by chance population is huge in this emergence story. This is a graph of human population growth uh, for the last 2,000 or so years. I mean, it just, you know, it's, it's remained at such a low level for many years. Uh, and then look at how it's taken off uh, very recently. These are billions of people, of course. And uh, with this, we invade different parts of the world. We have more contact with animals that carry their viruses. And the crowding among humans helps to spread them as well. So an example is our alteration of the Amazon forest in South America. This is a map of the Amazon region, north, the North Amazon in Brazil. And these are all, um, all these little letters here are various viruses uh, that have been isolated from this, from this region. Um, and these are viruses. Some of them are arthropod-borne, and there are other viruses in there as well. So, and there are probably many, many more out there that we haven't d discovered yet. So the point is, you know, people go in, they clear these forests, they encounter uh, animals or insects with these uh, viruses in them, and the chance for infection is quite high. And we do this constantly all over the globe. Here are some examples of uh, emerging virus infections. Uh, here's the name of the virus on the left and the family. And what, on the right of this column, some of the drivers of emergence. What are the factors that led these viruses to be able to travel from an animal into a human? Because as you might guess, this isn't going to be a common occurrence. But sometimes we make scenarios that really promote it. So I've already spoken about dengue virus, how you know, making the, the, the international use tire trade help spread uh, the mosquito that carries the virus around the world. We'll talk about Ebola virus next week, but uh, the bushmeat trade is a big factor uh, in uh, the spread of Ebola virus from bats to humans, uh, as, as it is for HIV. Uh, we'll see again next week how HIV went from monkeys into humans and was amplified by other human activities. We'll talk about some of these other viruses today, hantavirus, which is a consequence of human rodent contact. We'll talk about the factors that increase the contact between the two species. A hendrovirus, which goes from bats to horses to stable uh, workers. Of course, influenza virus 
which has been emerging into humans for many, many years, is a consequence, increased consequence of uh, huge numbers of pig and bird farms growing these animals for food consumption. Nipah virus we'll talk about today. Again, bats to pigs to human. Many of these viruses uh, get pushed into people by consequence of agriculture, um, by human rodent contact, or by the construction of dams or simply irrigating uh, farmlands brings new viruses into contact with people. So this is not anything new. We've done these for many these activities for many many years, but they they have increased lately, uh, and we do new things as well that we didn't do before. And don't forget, as we're talking about emergence, what we talked about last last time, the evolution of viruses, and that. There's, there's a huge biodiversity out there. Every virus exists as a quasi-species with many, many, many mutants present. And one of those may just be suited for a virus to replicate in a person should the virus be able to get into that person. And if that virus, an animal car carrying that virus, contacts a person, the virus may be selected uh, to be able to replicate there as well. So first, let's look at the different kinds of interactions of hosts and viruses. We have four different uh, categories shown here, resistant, evolving, dead end, and stable. So these are four different host virus interactions that we talk about that help explain how emergence occurs. Now the stable interaction, that is a stable virus host interaction, this is what we think of for most human virus infections and indeed uh, many animal viruses as well. Uh, the virus and the host have been together for a long period of time, and the virus transmits successfully, the host survives. An evolving infection is one where the virus has recently joined uh, the species. It was probably present in a stable uh, interaction in another species, but now it's crossed over. Uh, it's in the process, perhaps, of adapting to the new host. Then we have what we call dead-end infections. Uh, these are when uh, a, spe a new species acquires the virus. It could be from an evolving infection or a stable situation, uh, but it only goes to that species and never transmits to anyone else. And finally, in the resistant host, uh, no virus replication occurs, uh, so uh, that, that's really a dead end for that as well. Let's look at each of these in some detail. So first we'll look at the stable host virus interaction in the green box. And as I said, both the virus and the host coexist. The virus gets to spread to new hosts. Uh, the hosts survive for the most part. But of course, both the virus and the host evolve over long periods of time, as we talked about last time. Now, many of these are permanent. So we have a couple of examples here of infections that are exclusively human, like measles, herpes simplex, uh, human cytomegalovirus, smallpox virus. As far as we know, we're the only host. These viruses originated in animals, and then they evolved to become an exclusively uh, human virus, and now they exist in a stable interaction. Of course, smallpox has been eradicated, but when it was around, that was a stable virus-host interaction. In some cases, the virus can infect more than one species, so not all human viruses are exclusively human. They can go back and forth. Uh, influenza A virus does that. Uh, flaviviruses and togoviruses, and we'll look at a couple of examples of that today. So that is our stable uh, host virus interaction. Poliovirus would be another one that falls into this category of human-specific viruses as well. Next, the evolving uh, host virus relationship. Again, this is one where the host and the virus are probably changing and the infection may be different depending on when we look at it. This, these can be lethal infections or they may not do anything uh, in the host at all. And some examples of this would be uh, the introduction of smallpox and measles viruses to American natives uh, by old world colonists and slave traders. And we'll talk a little bit about that. These populations had never seen these viruses before. They had gone from animals to humans in Europe or the Middle East and those animals weren't present say in the Americas and then they are brought over by colonists and once they got into that population the explosion of infection and rapid evolution of the virus. Uh, West Nile virus coming to the Western Hemisphere in 1999 which we've talked about is another example. The virus rapidly spread uh, through the US and evolved 
uh, as it did so. And then finally, of course, the introduction of rabbits into Australia that we talked about last time in order to get rid of, uh, to, to hunt the rabbits, and then they had to put a virus in to kill the rabbits. Uh, and that evolved, the virus and the rabbit populations both evolved in the first few years. So these are examples of evolving situations where the virus newly enters a host and things are in flux. Dead end interactions are probably very common out there. Um, they often occur in a cross-species infection. The virus goes into the host and it effectively ends there. It doesn't really become a human virus. Uh, this is the way Ebola virus uh, occurs in both humans and chimps and gorillas. Uh, these are, again, zoonotic infections. The virus comes from a bat to a human, and it may spread among humans or even among uh, animals in the forest, but eventually the, in the chain of infection dies out. It's not sustained as a human pathogen, and we need another uh, introduction. We consider that a dead-end infection. Sometimes the uh, host doesn't transmit the uh, infection at all to other members. Uh, avian influenza H5N1 occurs when an infected bird transmits the virus to a human. These are cases where people are working with poultry or in many places, uh, people who own poultry sleep with the animals in their homes and infection is transmitted. And that virus largely stays in humans and does not travel travel uh, effectively from one human to another. So a dead end interaction. As you might expect, they don't really contribute much to the virus in nature, even though our headlines go crazy over Ebola deaths, right? And they, there are people dying, that's understandable. But in the, in the sense of nature, all the viruses and the virus host interactions out there, these are minuscule, these are insignificant. You know, there've been a few thousand Ebola infections, there've been uh, a, a thousand or so H5N1 infections. These don't contribute to the uh, ecology of the virus whatsoever. So here's an example of a stable host virus interaction that involves multiple species. Here is a virus that is carried by a mosquito among wild birds. So here's our mosquito biting, it bites a wild bird and uh, inoculates uh, the virus. Then maybe another mosquito will pick it up and there's a cycle of mosquito bird, mosquito bird transmission. Uh, of course, the, these mosquitoes can infect other hosts as well, and uh, the birds can be bit by other mosquitoes and transmit the infection to a whole set of individuals as well. So that's the stable host virus interaction. These occur in nature. and We, we largely don't see them, uh, but they are out there and they, they occur in great numbers. Occasionally, of course, humans or other animals will encounter a mosquito and be bitten by it and will be inoculated with this particular virus. Uh, they will, may or may not develop disease depending on the host response, etc. But they're dead-end hosts. They will not transmit it to anyone else. For the most part, they don't have enough virus in them such that if a mosquito bit them, it would then pick up enough virus to transmit to another host. So it's only in the natural host cycle that the mosquito can pick up virus from the host when it bites it to, to transmit to another animal. Okay, so humans and horses in this scenario are examples of uh, dead-end interactions coming off of a stable uh, virus-host interaction. Uh, here's another one which simply illustrates the same thing, both stable and dead-end uh, interactions with a different uh, virus-host set. Here we have ticks transmitting uh, the virus among rodents. Uh, and this is the cycle that occurs in nature, the stable cycle. Occasionally the ticks can uh, transmit the virus to other ticks at birth transovarially. The ticks can bite uh, other, other hosts and transmit the virus. And humans are dead end hosts typically. Uh, the humans may or may not develop disease, but they don't spread it to one another for the same reasons that the mosquitoes don't pick up virus from the infected humans. And occasionally ticks may bite goats and spread the infection to them, and then humans can acquire the infection with this particular uh, virus, a tick-borne encephalitis virus, uh, can be transmitted to humans by goat milk. So here are some other examples of dead-end infections uh, in people. Uh, yellow fever in monkeys, uh, with, sorry, yellow fever in humans, but the, the natural host is monkeys. But when we get bitten by, the, by a mosquito carrying this virus from a monkey, it ends in us. 
uh, Marburg, Ebola, Hendra, Nipah, SARS, Progenitor, all of viruses that we will uh, talk about in this course, uh, these are all pretty much dead-end infections. Now, I know you're saying, well, didn't Ebola spread to other people? Yes, of course it spreads, but eventually it dies out. It doesn't sustain itself, and you have to have another reintroduction. So that's the definition of a dead-end. Uh, Lassa virus, Hunin sin nombre, uh, the latter of which is, it goes from rodents to humans. And if you think about it, in the laboratory, our, our animal models for virus infections, these are all dead-end virus-host interactions. They don't, for the most part, transmit among the laboratory animals. So you infect a mouse with polio virus. The mouse gets polio, but it doesn't transmit it to another animal. In fact, it's very hard to get transmission uh, in laboratory uh, animal models. And of course, it doesn't occur outside from the laboratory animal to other animals outside. So these are dead-end infections. So let's talk very briefly and in general terms about how an emerging infection can, can arise. Again, this would be a new virus going into a species that's never seen it before. Uh, there are two steps. The virus has to be introduced to the new species. The, we have to encounter an animal that carries the particular virus. And, you know, depending on where you are, it's more or less likely that this will occur. If you go to the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest, you're more likely to encounter an animal carrying a new virus than in Central Park. I mean, you could encounter something new in Central Park, but it's not very likely. You have to be introduced to this new virus, and then, of course, it has to become established in you and spread to other people. If it doesn't spread out of you, we, we're likely not even to know about it, uh, but it, it won't be a successful infection. We always encounter new viruses pretty much we ev wherever we are, and I think some of us do so on a daily basis. We certainly ingest a lot of viruses in our food, but most of them don't replicate in us, so, so they're, uh, they're resistant host interactions. Uh, some of these viruses we encounter do replicate. You may go camping or you may go somewhere exotic and encounter new viruses and you come back fine and you would never know that you did in fact encounter uh, a virus. You may get infected. The virus may actually replicate in you. You may come back from a trip and feel a strange little flu-like symptoms for a while. But then in the week you recover and that's the end of it and you never think about it twice. But maybe you had an infection with a new virus. You never spread it to anyone else. Uh, and that's the end of it. And I think this happens all the time. It probably stimulates our immune system and it's probably beneficial. But to get a successful infection, uh, this virus needs to go on. And of course, some of the things we've talked about before, the requirements for getting a successful infection, you have to have susceptible and permissive cells, they have to be accessible, you have to have enough virus around. So, you know, if you encounter an animal, you have to get a good amount of virus to infect you. And if you're going to spread it to others, this is a very important factor, population density and health. If you are you know, a, a sole person who goes on a trip and then you come back and you never encounter anyone, you're never going to spread this infection. Of course, if you go into a big city, you have a much greater chance of doing that. So you see, this is a very rare event when you think about it to get a virus coming from an animal into humans and then spreading and causing some notable uh, infection. So I think this happens uh, rarely. I think the encounters are very frequent and they end very early on. Remember, to get a sustained infection in a human population, we have to have a chain of serial, uh, serial infections, a chain of transmission occur, and, and this requires lots of factors that often may not be present. Now, the encounters with new viruses can happen in different ways, and as our society, as our world has developed, we've made more opportunities for encountering viruses, and some of them are listed here. Uh, we do a lot of modifying of our environment, but the building of dams, for example, irrigation, deforestation, uh, wildlife parks, transport, long-distance transport of wildlife, all these things increase the chance that a virus that we've never encountered before we are now are going to encounter, and it could infect humans and spread among the population. Of course, air travel, uh, moving into various parts of the world, building big, big cities, 
All those are obvious. Use tire trade we've talked about before. But seemingly innocuous things like daycare centers. We put young kids together in ways that they were never together before. And if a virus is introduced in that situation, it can spread uh, through that population and then back uh, to the parents as well. Um, hot tubs are another way. If the hot tubs aren't properly sanitized, the viruses can be introduced from wildlife and then they might infect you when you go in there. And then, of course, we have uh, other things like blood transfusions, which are a pretty recent development in medicine. We have to keep on top of this blood supply because we don't, this is a donated blood supply and we have to make sure we check for all viruses. And, and, and years ago, many viral infections were transmitted through the blood supply and we didn't know about them. Xenotransplantation. We take organs from animals like heart valves from pigs and put them into people. These pigs have their own set of viruses and that's one source of infection, but then we immunosuppress the transplant recipient, making it even more likely that a virus is gonna cross over. So people are very worried about this as we start to increase our use of animal parts for transplanting. And then uh, sex and drug abuse is a great way to spread uh, virus infections, and this has only increased with time. So let's talk a little bit about some examples of introduction of viruses into new populations. And one of them that we know a lot about um, it comes under the category diseases of exploration and colonization. I, I just touched on this briefly before. Um, an example is smallpox, which um, emerged in the Far East and then spread to Europe. And of course, when it went to Europe, the virus wiped out many, many people because no one had been infected with it before. There was no immunity. And the population hadn't been genetically selected for resistance. Over many years, as a virus replicates in the population, you select for individuals who are more resistant, much like the rabbits uh, in Australia. It just takes longer. Uh, smallpox then, of course, was brought over to the New World. Other viruses were as well, measles, but we're looking at smallpox here. In two years, around 1520, it killed 3.5 million Aztecs. And this is one of the main reasons why Cortez could, in fact, conquest um, so many people with a very relatively small army because uh, his soldiers brought in smallpox virus. Uh, they were shedding it and uh, the, this native population was completely susceptible to infection. So this is an example of a, this is uh, not a zoonosis of course because it's going from humans to other humans and these kinds of situations we really don't have anymore uh, because of globalization. But it's a great example of how when you introduce a new virus into an immune population, you can have severe outcomes. Yellow fever is another a good example of this. Yellow fever virus exists in jungles in a cycle among monkeys transmitted by mosquito. It goes from monkey to monkey, and it's been in that cycle for many, many years. But as you know, humans encroach upon forests as they expand and develop. Uh, we we encountered yellow fever when we were building the Panama Canal. In fact, this was when it was discovered. Uh, the people who went in and dug and were digging the trench, so to speak, they started getting sick and dying because there were mosquitoes there who had bitten monkeys who were viremic and, and they passed the virus on to people. And it was a big impediment towards construction of the canal. We had to go in and figure what was going on. And that's when we realized it was a mosquito-borne uh, illness. Uh, this graph shows an example of the importation of yellow fever into Philadelphia during the early years of uh, the United States, 1793. Uh, here, uh, in, in late July, the virus came from Santo Domingo. It was brought in and sl by slave importation. Uh, the slaves had been infected on Santo Domingo. They were brought into various cities. Uh, the mosquitoes then bit them and spread the virus to others. And you can see this outbreak uh, of uh, yellow fever, quite a few cases and deaths, and only went away when the temperatures fell and the mosquitoes died. So here we have imported this infection uh, into the U.S. largely through ignorance. And, this, and many people were very worried about this. Thomas Jefferson that it would discourage the growth of great cities in our nation. This infection actually spread as far north as Boston. It's not present anymore today, 
because of uh, mosquito control and so forth. But it's an example of how you can bring an infection somewhere where it's not indigenous. All right, so those are two examples of how you introduce a virus into a new population, you have a serious disease. Now there's another example I want to share with you, which is poliovirus. And this is an example of how changes in human practices can change the pattern of infection of uh, a virus. Poliomyelitis, uh, the paralytic disease caused by poliovirus infection, has been known uh, for many years. I showed you, I think, before this Egyptian carving from about 3000 BC. We think this priest has polio uh, in his leg. It's a very typical case presentation. But there were never outbreaks of polio until the, 20, the onset of the 20th century uh, in North America, Europe, and other places as well. So for 4,000 years or so, this virus existed in a very stable host virus relationship between humans uh, and occasionally caused paralysis, but no outbreaks. But all of a sudden in the 20th century, boom, we had outbreaks of polio. And we think that's because of improved uh, sanitation. We, before the onset of the 20th century, we didn't know really how to take care of our sewage. And there was rampant transmission of the virus, which is fecally or orally transmitted, to kids very shortly after birth. And remember, when you're born, you have your mother's complement of antibodies. So these children were prevented from getting polio, but they would get an infection that would boost their immunity, and that would be the end of it. You now delay infection. You're not getting infected at birth anymore because of good sanitation. We have toilets and so forth and water treatment. You now get infected later when your mother's antibodies are gone, more likely to get polio. So this is why we had outbreaks of poliomyelitis. And those are shown on this graph here. These are cases of reported polio uh, in the US. You see very little in the uh, 1800s, a little blip here. This is the first outbreak in the US. Uh, that was 32 cases in Vermont. Uh, and then, starting at the turn of the century, bigger and bigger outbreaks with thousands of cases until the biggest one, uh, 28,000 uh, in the Northeast. And so this, again, is by, this happened by pushing the a onset of infection beyond those early years when you're protected by uh, maternal uh, antibodies. And of course, we talked a lot about how quarantining uh, paralyzed people was really useless. Lots of these signs like this were put on, uh, on houses where a paralyzed person was living, keep out of this house, but really the, all the unparalyzed people walking around were doing the damage. Now that's an example of how changing human conditions can change the pattern of a disease. So you would say that poliomyelitis was an emerging infection back in the early 1900s. Uh, influenza has been a continually emerging disease for many years, and this is in part because the virus is present in many other species in the environment, and also because we have increased our growth of birds and pigs to feed uh, the growing human population. So uh, the, the natural hosts of influenza viruses are wild ducks, water, wild ducks and other water birds of various sorts. And in these animals, the virus is actually a gastrointestinal infection. I think I mentioned this last time. Um, depending on the virus, the, the water bird may not get sick, but may fly around and shed virus as it excretes feces because it's a GI infection. And this can spread the virus to many other hosts, including uh, domesticated animals such as geese or turkeys uh, or chickens. And that's how we acquire some new influenza viruses. So influenza viruses in humans, of course, are a human infection. The H1N1s, H2N2s, and the H3N2s, these are all human viruses. But remember, they go back into birds, they reassort their RNA segments with bird viruses, and then new ones emerge by chance, and they come back into us to start uh, a whole new pandemic. So we have human influenza viruses, but then we have this threat of animal influenza viruses. They're out there, they're infecting billions and billions of birds that are out there. And so people are just trying to figure out how to predict when the next one will come and start a big outbreak. So here on the bottom is an example of a new strain of influenza, H7N9, which is a strain of avian influenza virus, which is known to be present in wild birds of various sorts, and occasionally will infect chickens 
um, because as you know, you, you grow chickens in large numbers on farms and if a wild bird uh, virus reaches these chickens, it will take off and replicate in them. And this is an outbreak of H7N9, which started in China uh, at the beginning of 2013. Uh, at, and this particular, this goes just to the end of 2013, 143 cases and 45 deaths. To, to this point today, I just checked last night, there have been, I'm sorry, 631 cases that should be and 253 deaths. So a rather high mortality rate. The origin of this virus is chickens sold at live meat markets. So in many parts of the world, chickens are brought into open markets, they're slaughtered, and, give, and sold to the customers, and those chickens may be infected with these viruses, and then you, know, you pick up your chicken, you get influenza virus, and then you get sick, and that's what many of these infections are from. These viruses don't transmit well among people, and so you know, curtailing the meat market actually is effective at curtailing some of these outbreaks, but the fear is the virus will somehow evolve to transmit well among humans, and so people are very worried about this. This is just one example of the many different avian influenza viruses that are out there. H5N1 is another one. It periodically goes from chickens into people. High mortality rate, and we're just wondering, is this ever going to take off and be able to become a human virus? But again, this is particularly a consequence of the increasing growth of birds and pigs. These viruses can also infect pigs, and then the pig handlers get infected and can transmit the virus to other humans. The, the huge size of pig farms and chicken farms is really contributing uh, to the ability of this virus to infect people. Bats are another source of zoonotic infections. So those influenza viruses that go from chickens to people, we would say those are zoonotic infections. In contrast to the human influenza viruses which continuously circulate among us, bats apparently are loaded with viruses of all different sorts. Um, we, we learned a number of years ago that a few human viruses originated in bats and since then people have gone and looked in bat populations and find hundreds and hundreds of viruses of all sorts. And they don't seem to, to hurt the bats whatsoever. Somehow the bat's immune system, which we don't understand very well, can deal with these infections. The bats are healthy. They spread among bat populations. Occasionally they get into people. It's inevitable as we expand our populations and expand where we build our homes that we're going to get viruses from bats. This is a particular kind of bat called a, a flying fox, uh, where a, few, a number of pathogenic human viruses uh, have been discovered. And in particular, I want to tell you about a couple of paramyxoviruses uh, that have been found in bats and that infect humans. These are viruses related to measles virus, same virus family. So, so fruit bats are quite large. Uh, they can have a wingspan of about this big or so. So the first one I want to tell you about is called Nipah virus. Uh, this was discovered in 1998 in Malaysia. It caused an outbreak of respiratory and neurological disease on pig farms. So the, the virus somehow got into the pig population. It then spread to the people who were taking care of the pigs and uh, 105 human deaths. They had to kill all these pigs to stop the infection. This is one of the m most horrific things I've seen. They just dug huge pits and pushed the pigs into them and covered them over. You can find movies of this online because they couldn't go through, I suppose, and euthanize them one by one. So that stopped the outbreak, and then finally, afterwards, they figured out what had happened. So the pig farms are built near the edge of the forest. The bats come uh, out of the forest, uh, and they shed virus in the urine. So the fruit bats, for example, uh, do that. The, the farmers have mango trees planted uh, near the pig pens. Uh, the bats like to eat the mangoes at night. They, uh, they'll pick up a mango on the ground and eat it and contaminate it with virus, and then the next day a pig will come over, eat the mango, and get infected. So that probably started off that infection. Again, being so close to the bat habitat, you now can get infected with these bat viruses. Uh, there have subsequently been uh, other outbreaks of this virus in India and Bangladesh that were traced to the consumption of date palm sap. And so this took a while to figure out, but there are um, a number of these areas. The uh, people put on um, palm uh, sap collecting buckets 
on the date palm trees, and apparently this is delicious and, and uh, a highly prized delicacy. Uh, but what would happen is they leave these on continuously to collect the sap. At night, the bats would come in because they like the sap too. And when they, while they're drinking the sap, they contaminate, they probably urinate in it and contaminate it with their viruses. And people go and drink it and they get infected uh, with this virus. Uh, there's, there's, some, it, there's some indication of human to human transmission uh, of this virus, but mainly because uh, when someone dies in these areas from this infection, the tradition is to prepare, the family prepares the body for burial, and that's how the infection uh, is transmitted, close contact among family members. So again, this is a virus that uh, originated in bats, and because of our activities, we encountered it. The other one, which is also a member of the paramyxovirus family, is called hendrovirus. This was discovered in 1994 in Australia, and it caused an outbreak that killed 14 racehorses and one of the trainers uh, of the racehorses uh, on the farm. And again, this virus came from flying foxes. We think a similar scenario, flying foxes contaminating fruit, which the horses then eat. Uh, and then the horse trainers, of course, in very close contact with the horses, and the virus spreads to them. These, again, these continue to occur. Um, spreads from bats to horses. These are race horses, so they're very expensive. So a vaccine has been developed to protect the race horses. And in fact, um, this, this uh, I'll tell you about that in a moment. This is a map that shows you the distribution of uh, the outbreaks of these two viruses. So Nipah virus in the blue diamonds. So you can see here, uh, India, Bangladesh, and Malaysia outbreaks. And then the Hendra virus outbreaks all along the northeast coast of uh, Australia. So those are where the outbreaks have occurred. And the blue line here is the home range of the uh, flying fox, the fruit bats. So these bats have quite a wide range. So the possibility remains that there could be, uh, it's considered that people in these other areas are at risk for infection as well. These are quite impressive bats. I saw a bunch of them. I visited this fellow in Australia, uh, Lin Fa Wang. He uh, runs a lab there to study bat viruses. And he developed a Hendra vaccine for horses. So the idea was not enough humans get sick. So it's not ma worth making a vaccine uh, to immunize humans. But a lot of horses get sick, and these are expensive horses. So he developed a vaccine for horses. It protects them, and that, of course, prevents the virus from spilling over into people because the people are getting the virus from horses. So this is, if you've heard of the expression one health, which means that human and other non-human animals' healths are all intertwined in this world because we are passing these viruses among us, this is a true one health uh, solution to this problem. Uh, so I had a conversation with Linfa. He talked about how he developed this vaccine. He talked about uh, fruit bats and how he studies them. And all the viruses he's discovered uh, in bats as well. Really interesting conversation. He's the real Batman. Forget about um, that other guy. What's his name? I can't remember. Anyway, he's the real Batman. OK, another example of how climate can make a virus emerge. And this one is um, a disease called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, a really serious lung infection discovered apparently for the first time in the Four Corners area of New Mexico, 1993. So here are the Four Corners right there where these four states uh, come together. Um, it was figured out that the disease, initially noted in a very healthy young man, was caused by a virus called Sinombre virus, which uh, is endemic in the deer mouse. The deer mouse is Paromyscus maniculatus. And this is, this is a mouse that you can find in many places um, uh, of the US. And about 30% of the wild mice are positive for this virus. And so that is the one that caused this disease. Uh, parenthetically, the virus, when it was first isolated, it was isolated from, usually you name viruses according to where they're isolated. And so this was called Muerto Canyon virus, but the people who lived near Muerto Canyon, didn't want a virus named after 
their, their home area. So the, the CDC went through a couple of other names. They didn't like any of them, so they finally settled on Sin Nombre. So it's kind of a little dig at them. Right. Anyway, this is a uh, hantavirus. It's an enveloped virus uh, with an RNA genome in three segments. And uh, it's a negative stranded RNA genome. So why did this infection suddenly emerge? There have been infections since then of the same uh, virus, the same hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Well, it turns out that in this year, 92-93, uh, there's a lot more rainfall than usual. And one of the things that grows in this area are pignon nuts, uh, which um, not only humans like to eat, but mice like to eat them uh, as well. So lots of pignon nuts. The mouse population exploded because of this. And as a consequence, it became more likely for the mice to encounter humans. That's a deer mouse, by the way, a couple of deer mice. Um, the mice, when infected, they're fine. They don't get sick. They excrete the virus in urine and feces. So if you have mice in your house, you know, if they're mouse droppings or mouse urine, that can have virus in it, and it can be readily aerosolized. So if you see uh, mouse droppings, you shouldn't really vacuum them because you can aerosolize it. You should kind of spray them with bleach and wait a bit and then brush them into a pan. But if you do things like sweeping or vacuuming that aerosolize, you're then going to generate an aerosol. You inhale it, and that's what these individuals did. These mice were living in their home because there were so many of them, and they got infected. So we're not the natural host, right? The, the, the deer mouse is the natural host of the virus. It gets into us. Dead end host, serious infection is possible. It doesn't spread from person to person, right? That's why it's a dead end infection. It turned out retrospective uh, analysis of other respiratory infections. This, is, this infection had been around before. We could see as early as 1959 cases that looked like it. So part of the lesson here is that we're getting really good at detecting viruses when we see them, whereas maybe 40 years ago we weren't so good at it. This is a map of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome cases uh, up until April of uh, last year. And you can see by state, it, it varies according to the state. Some of the western states have uh, lots of cases. Um, and that's, the, the mice are there, of course. But the mice are distributed throughout the US. So you do get some cases uh, in the northeast as well. We've had a couple uh, in New York state. Um, this is the range on the lower right here of the uh, deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus. The virus can also be find, found in other kinds of mice, white-footed mice, the rice rat, and the cotton rat. So, you know, you could have this virus in New York City mice, so should, you should really be careful uh, when you're contacting mice that you don't aerosolize their excreta. Now, a couple of years ago, I was just... the, the just after finishing teaching this course, there was an outbreak, a small outbreak of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome at Yosemite. Uh, there are a couple of cases here. So these are individuals who were uh, staying in tent cabins. So these are pre-erected uh, structures. You go and you, you live in there out in the forest. And the mice had built nests in these, of course, and they had left their droppings in the cabins. And these individuals inhaled the aerosols produced by them, and they got a hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. So this has also happened in upstate New York. People go camping and they encounter mice. So you have to be very careful. And if you do go camping and you get these respiratory symptoms, uh, you have to uh, get yourself to a physician. There are lots of other hantaviruses out there. So uh, the one that causes this syndrome, C. nombre virus, is just one of them. These are what we call the New World hantaviruses. You can find them in. Uh, North and South America, uh, the ones in orange have been associated with human diseases. So here's uh, C. nombre virus, and the host, of course, is Paramiscus maniculatus. Lots of other viruses uh, throughout the country. Here's one from, this is a mouse in New York that's been shown to harbor a hantavirus. Uh, throughout the U.S. and South America, many viruses in this family associated with disease and others not, but who knows? So there's lots of potential here for encountering new infections. These, these are the different species, by the way, of rodents that harbor these different viruses. So there are lots of rodents out there harboring various viruses. So the, the, the moral is you have to really be careful because uh, one of these could trigger an infection. 
uh, the other, another virus, emerging virus I want to talk about that gives us some nice lessons and principles is the SARS coronavirus. SARS standing for Severe Atypical Respiratory Syndrome. And this is another example of a virus that emerged from a bat, and we'll see what the risk factors were. This began in uh, November 22, Guangdong province of China, an outbreak of severe pneumonia, which hadn't been seen before, unknown etiology, all of a sudden this outbreak, no one knew what was causing it. Uh, and that initial outbreak, 305 cases with five deaths. So this uh, was initially not widely publicized, um, which led to it spreading globally, as you will see. But here's some of the characteristics of the disease, incubation period, uh, the prodrome, chills, headache, mal malaise, mal mal myalgia, flu-like syndrome, uh, followed by dry cough, shortness of breath. And, and a number of the individuals who are infected need to have artificial ventilation because this is a serious disease that affects lung function. Uh, the way it spread, one of the ways it spread extensively was uh, a Chinese doctor who had treated some of those first patients in that first outbreak. He went to uh, Hong Kong on, on February in 2003, and he stayed on the ninth floor of this now famous hotel. It's called the Metropole Hotel. If you Google Metropole Hotel, you will find SARS coronavirus at the same time. Um, when he was there, he got sick. He died the next day, died in the hospital. But while he was in the hospital for that one day, he spread his infection uh, to 10 other people. And this is being Hong Kong. People come from everywhere. And those people flew to Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, and the US. Still incubation period. They're shedding virus, but no symptoms. So this is one of those infections where you're infectious, contagious during the incubation period. So this, he was a super spreader in this sense, because he spread it to a lot of people who then went on and spread it globally. And this ended up uh, bringing the virus to 8,000 people, 29 countries, with about a 10% uh, mortality uh, case, I would say case fatality ratio, the number of deaths over the number of confirmed uh, cases. So this is a, um, a map of the transmission in the Metropole Hotel. So people went back and did very, very careful epidemiology uh, in this hotel. So here is uh, Hotel Metropole, and here's our physician, A, who came from uh, Guangdong. Remember, he treated some patients there. He went to the hotel, and then he, um, he eventually died. And some of the um, healthcare workers who took care of him got sick uh, as well. Uh, but then he infected people who went on to Vietnam, Singapore, the U.S., and other countries as well. And th these could be traced uh, to each of those countries. And then they had contacts as well in those countries. For example, 21 in Vietnam, one healthcare worker in the U.S., et cetera. So 249 cases that could be traced directly back to uh, our physician. <clears throat> this is the epidemiologic curve of the outbreak, again, starting in February. You see the peak of the outbreak, uh, and then th it was over in July 23. Uh, 1,700 cases uh, as of this date in just Hong Kong alone. Now, um, globally, again, over 8,000 cases with about a 10% case fatality rate, and this was the distribution of cases. We didn't have many here in the U.S., quite a few in Canada, uh, not a lot in Europe, most of them uh, in Asia, as you can see here. Now, this, this outbreak was culled um, by a number of measures. It turns out it was caused by a coronavirus. And we have talked a bit about these viruses in this course. These are envelope viruses with a plus-stranded RNA genome. They have the longest RNA genome that, was, that we know of, about 30,000 bases long. And they're typical envelope viruses with spike glycoproteins that attach to cells' receptors. So these were isolated very early on from some of the sick individuals, and these are called SARS coronaviruses. Uh, the way that the virus uh, is transmitted by respiratory droplets, you're infected, uh, you sneeze and cough and transmit aerosols to others. The virus multiplies in epithelial cells of your respiratory tract and eventually goes down into the lung in the alveoli where it causes lung injury. And we believe that the virus is a very good suppressor of the immune response. It has a variety of proteins that can suppress 
innate and adaptive responses, very much like we've talked about before in this course. And this probably is, accounts for the more severe disease caused by this virus. One of the reasons the uh, outbreak was curtailed is that there were a lot of public health measures taken. We didn't have any vaccines, we didn't have any antivirals, uh, but for example, uh, initially the airports were closed. This is the Hong Kong airport, nobody in it. Here's a poster that appeared in Hong Kong shortly before the outbreak. Hong Kong will take your breath away. And indeed it, it did, the people who got <laughs> SARS. This was the first time that we did airport screening for temperature. These uh, monitors were developed. As people walked by them, they could tell if you had a temperature or not. The, the virus infection caused a high temperature, and if you had a temperature, you're sent back to your hotel. You couldn't travel and spread the infection. Lots of public informational posters were, were put up everywhere. So a lot of this sort of preventative uh, activity was done, and this really played a big role in uh, curtailing the infection simply by curtailing travel. What was the origin of this virus? Well, the um, sera collected before the outbreak from people in the area in Hong Kong and Guangdong where the early outbreaks were, no antibodies to the virus. So this is a brand new virus apparently that's gone into people. Um, and the earliest cases in Guangdong were people who worked in the live meat markets. Again, very much like influenza virus, you, you bring animals to the live meat market, uh, they're slaughtered there and sold, and this is right, unprotected meat basically which can spread viruses quite readily. These animal handlers also had much higher antibodies to the virus than control groups. So after the outbreak, sera was collected from these individuals, and they in general had higher antibodies to uh, this virus than anybody else. So they were implicated in the initial spread of the virus. Uh, meanwhile, people were looking for related viruses in other animals, and uh, similar viruses were isolated from horseshoe bats, a different species of bat from the fruit bat, in different areas of China quite far apart. 84% uh, of the bats that were examined in a variety of studies had antibodies that cross-reacted with SARS coronaviruses. The sequences of these viruses, they're called bat SARS-like coronaviruses, quite similar uh, to human viruses. Um, early on, some of these viruses were isolated from civets, palm civets, which are one of the animals sold at the meat market. Uh, and these viruses were similar to those uh, as well. Originally, they thought civets might have been the source of the virus, but it turns out that that's not true. Uh, these bat viruses showed greater genetic diversity uh, than those in people and civets. So the idea is that these were the progenitors of human uh, coronaviruses. So the bats are the reservoirs out in nature and somehow they get to people via market animals. One possibility is that the civet gets contaminated on a farm or in the wild and is brought to the meat market or perhaps some other animal as well. There's still a lot of, uh, a lot of this puzzle that we don't understand in terms of the transmission, but it looks pretty clear that these bad viruses, the progenitor, uh, just last year, people are still continuing to monitor wild bat populations for these viruses. And just last year, a number of isolates were made of viruses very similar to the human virus. So it's quite clear that they're out there uh, in bats. So the question is, uh, will SARS return? Well, that's a really good question. There hasn't been any transmission since that outbreak. There was a small uh, outbreak of four cases in the same province uh, in December, January. Remember, the outbreak had just ended. Uh, this constituted a new spillover from bats to humans, separate from the first one. But this virus wasn't as well suited to replicating in people, and it didn't spread very well at all, only, th only four cases. And as I said, this precursor continues to circulate uh, in animals. And you know the, one of the after effects was the banning of wild game in these live meat markets. So that probably had a good uh, effect on the transmission. Many people tell me though, if you go to these areas, you can still buy contraband wild meat because if you, people want something, there's a way to get it always, right? So I don't think that that's been eliminated anyway. So, but anyway, uh, if, um, if this virus does reemerge, we're gonna recognize it very quickly. Unfortunately, we don't have any vaccines or antivirals still. 
um, but uh, per perhaps we'll be able to limit it as we did before. Now another coronavirus has come onto the scene since then, and that's the MERS coronavirus, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. First case, September 2012, a 60-year-old male patient who died of pneumonia and renal failure. And from him, the virus was recovered in cell culture. The genome was sequenced. The receptor was identified all within months. Really remarkable uh, progress. It, the sequencing showed it was not SARS coronavirus, but it was a coronavirus and was distantly related to coronaviruses that are known to circulate in bats. So possibly the ancestor of this virus is again a bat virus. Uh, these are the cases so far of infections with MERS coronavirus. Uh, here from the beginning 2012 uh, to uh, so the end of uh, 2013, uh, you can see 206 cases. The deaths are in the blue, the light blue and the total cases uh, are in blue. So um, you can see there have been substantial numbers of cases, not huge, but hundreds. Uh, and then this brings up the, um, I couldn't find one graph with all the numbers. This is the cases through the uh, part of 2014 here. You can see there was a substantial outbreak uh, in 2014. There was a period of relative quiet where there were just few cases and then another outbreak there as well. All of these cases are the, the, the large number, the, the lar for the most part, most of them have occurred in the Saudi Peninsula. You can see here uh, the red and the blue bars are the, a variety of cases. A number of cases have been exported. So people travel to different countries, Tunisia, France, the UK. Few have come to the US as well. They come, they get sick while they're in the country. They're cared for, um, but they don't spread the infection to others. So they have all probably originated here, mostly in Saudi Arabia and the surrounding uh, countries. So these are the numbers as of a few days ago. 1,106 laboratory confirmed cases, uh, 421 deaths. So if you divide those two, this gives you what we call the case fatality ratio. That's deaths over confirmed cases, 38%. This is a funny number because you know, People who go to the hospital, that's, that's what these confirmed cases are typically. They're very sick. So we don't have a sense of how many people get infected but don't get serious illness enough to go to a hospital. So it could be that there are many of those out there and some numbers are just starting to come in that there are asymptomatic infections. But these kind of numbers early on in a new virus infection can be a little misleading because they're not telling you the total number of people who are infected. So that's why I say the mortality ratio is unknown. The mortality ratio would be deaths in the numerator and the denominator would be total infections, not just clinically uh, apparent infections, but every infection. That's a hard number to get, but that would really tell you the severity of the virus infection. Uh, so apparently uh, one major source of this infection is dromedary camels, the, the ones with one hump. And there are lots of these camels in this area. Uh, they're grown for food. They're grown as pets. They're grown for milk. They're grown to race. And people love them. They love their camels like people here love their dogs and their cats. And virus has been found in camels. Antibodies have been found in camels. So here, is, here are two different uh, parameters. Antibodies in camel sera. And, and you can just see here throughout Saudi Arabia, they've looked at a variety of camel populations. Many camels all over the country have antibodies. Uh, and then they've swabbed the noses of various camels throughout the country and looked for nucleic acids by PCR. You can see they're scattered around the country as well. Uh, so these animals have been infected. You can isolate virus from them. You can actually infect camels of this sort with the virus and it will replicate in them. And they generate an aerosol that has viruses in it. So they've been able to go into barns where camels are kept and measure virus, infectious virus uh, in the air. So it looks like at least some of these infections have come from camels. A number of the individuals who got sick have risk factors of being near a camel, but not everyone does. Not everyone has been anywhere near a camel and it's not clear how they're getting infection. There doesn't seem to be very much human-to-human -human transmission, again, only in healthcare facilities or 
close-knit family situations are you getting a little bit of transmission but this hasn't obviously transmitted among the, the general population it is a respiratory transmitted infection it's, it's transmitted by aerosol so again the worry is is this virus going to acquire greater transmissibility it has not done so so far some of the outstanding questions um, are camels the only reservoir? People have looked in other animals and they don't find it there. They're not in bats. Uh, they're a, a related viruses in bats, but not this one. They're not in a variety of other animals. Um, why did it start infecting people? You know, just a few years ago, we suddenly are picking up this MERS uh, infection. Why is that? What changed? Is there a role for bats? Did the bats infect camels some time ago? We don't know really how it's transmitted. Uh, being near a camel is a risk factor, but there are some people who aren't near camels. Why are so few humans infected? Many of the patients are very sick elderly people with other health problems, and that explains possibly why they're infected, but not everyone uh, fits into that risk category. We don't know why it doesn't transmit well. This one is a good idea. I think a camel vaccine would be a great idea, but apparently you this Saudi Arabia for one will not do this they love the camels and they don't want to vaccinate them so this doesn't seem at this point to be a viable option um, it, maybe we should think about making antivirals for the patients and treat that as well so there are lots of mysteries about this disease there hasn't been a single autopsy yet released about anyone who's died of this and this is a problem uh, again the Saudis don't want us to take a lot of samples from the country so um, this is a good example of how we need to have a little bit more international cooperation to figure out what is going here on here. So this is a summary of the coronaviruses that we know infect humans. So the MERS coronavirus, severe pneumonia, uh, apparently coming from a camel in 2012. SARS coronavirus, atypical pneumonia, basically severe, came from a bat in 23. Then we have four other uh, coronaviruses that are known to infect people. And they cause a variety of respiratory diseases, some more serious than others. Um, two of them seem to have originated from a bat virus and one from a cow coronavirus uh, in 1890. So just another example of how so many human viruses have uh, originated in animals. The last story I want to tell you doesn't concern human viruses, but it concerns dogs, which are pretty close to a lot of humans, and how a new virus uh, emerged to become a dog pathogen. And this is a canine parvovirus. So if you have a dog or a cat, you know you should get them immunized against parvovirus. There's one for dogs and one's for cats. This can kill them, and they can acquire it ve very easily. Uh, canine parvovirus didn't exist before 1978. It was just feline parvovirus. Well, there was feline panleukopenia virus. Um, but in 1978, this new disease emerged. It's an enteric and myocardial infection uh, in dogs. And a study of the virus indicated that it evolved from a cat virus called feline panleukopenia virus, another parvovirus. Uh, besides cats, this can infect other species as well. So this was a cat virus that somehow in 1978 evolved to be able to infect dogs and how it did that is summarized on this slide so we have our feline panleukopenia virus fpv uh, which can infect cats you can see the green arrow means it can infect cats cannot infect dogs but uh, between 1976 and 1978 a mutant of this fpv emerged which could now bind to a receptor in dogs. In cats, the FPV was known to bind the transferrin receptor, which is a cell surface protein. The virus underwent two amino acid changes, so it could now bind the transferrin receptor in dogs. We don't know how that happened. Again, a chance encounter of a dog with this virus, and somehow the right sequence was present so that the virus could bind the transferrin receptor. Uh, and then within a year, this virus spread globally. So now you have a virus uh, that can infect both dogs uh, and cats. And this virus has continued to evolve since 1978 into two lineages. Uh, there is a, a lineage that 
can infect both cats and dogs. And then there's a second lineage that can only uh, infect dogs. It's lost the ability to bind the cat uh, transferrin receptor. And these variants, when they arise, arise and spread very rapidly. They can spread globally within a year. Now, you may think that this is because dogs move around the world extensively, but this is not the case. The way these viruses spread is by international travel on contaminated footwear. You step on poop in Paris, and the next day you're in New York, and you bring the virus with you. So that's how it works. It's a really interesting uh, way to spread infection. Anyway, two amino acids, that's all it took for this virus to find a new receptor. And now in dogs, the virus can replicate uh, quite well. So this has been all about host range jumps. That's how new viruses emerge. I think that this happens all the time. There are host range jumps, but most of the times they result in dead end infections. It's very rare that any jump will produce a sustained infection. I've told you about some of the most prominent ones today that have happened in the last X years, but they're just very rare. Of course, they have serious consequences, but we're fortunate that it doesn't happen uh, more often. A really interesting question is whether we can predict host range jumps. So one goal of virology is to try and figure out all the viruses that are out there and see what is the potential for uh, viruses that might be the next human pathogen. But even, even when we do know all the viruses, I don't think we're going to be able to predict which one in particular is going to be uh, the one to, to start the next outbreak. However, there has emerged a whole new field called preparedness. There are now university departments, departments in hospitals all over the world, which deal with being prepared for the next outbreak. Now, you know this is the case for Ebola. Uh, there, the, every hospital in the country has some kind of Ebola response uh, team and procedures so that if you get a case, you will go through a list of things to do. And this is what's done for all serious virus threats. So being prepared is a big part of reacting when a new virus uh, comes by. We have great diagnostics now. We can identify viruses pretty quickly. Uh, and we can do the kinds of things that were done with SARS to stop transmission uh, very readily.